in rap history, there have been many famed jewelers that have been name dropped in countless songs and have had rappers and other celebrities flaunt the pieces that they've made for them. You probably heard the names of people like Johnny Dang, Ben Baller, Elliot Eliante, and many, many, many more. But there is one man who perhaps trumps them all and he's known as Jacob the Jeweler. A man who's considered to be the founding father of bling and hip hop's Diamond King. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys could be doing a million other things right now. But instead, you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Also, follow my Instagram too. That would be greatly appreciated. Also, let me know where you're tuning in from as well. Represent where you're from. All right, without further ado, let's get into the video. First things first, yo, if I mispronounce anything in this video, my sincerest apologies, but Jacob the Jeweler was born Yakov Arabov in Uzbekistan in June of 1965. When Jacob was growing up, Uzbekistan was a part of the Soviet Union and him and his family would eventually move to the United States for a better life. Jacob would spend his early childhood in Uzbekistan, so he has very limited memories. What he does remember is that the country was rich in culture, which is something that influenced his career choice. Him and his family are Jewish, and he did experience anti-Semitism because they didn't have freedom of religion there. He's described that living in the Soviet Union wasn't easy and that everything had to be the same. Everyone had the same furniture, the same shoes, etc. He was young, but he knew exactly what was going on at the time. But experiences like this opened his eyes to different lifestyles, different countries, and different laws. It meant that he was now comfortable no matter where he was. At the age of 13, Jacob's dad gave him a watch as a gift, which displayed two time zones, and it had a gold-plated map of the world on the dial. It had two mechanical movements, and that's where the idea for the five time zone watch came from. Jacob notes this moment as the start of his watchmaking journey. In an interview I read, it says that Jacob actually still has this watch, which is really cool because it still means a lot to him. But the very next year, when Jacob turned 14, him and his family would move to Queens, New York in the United States. Him and his family didn't have a lot of money coming over and Jacob would notice that everything was very different in the United States. New York is home to one of the world's largest Jewish populations and they made me feel welcome. I also noticed that I suddenly became Russian. People forgot that I was Jewish just because I was an immigrant from Russia, but it didn't really bother me. My Jewish faith helps me in all aspects of my life. The Jewish community in New York is so welcoming and warm that many people were willing to give me a shot to vouch for me. As a result, a lot of doors would open for me and I'm very grateful for that. When Jacob was 14, he helped out in a watchmaker's workshop. He loved all the tiny parts and gears and was enthralled by his dad's ability to bring life into a movement to assemble and then have the watch actually tell time. During his apprenticeship, Jacob learned how to take a watch apart, how many parts there were, and it really moved him how complicated even a simple watch was. This furthered his love for watchmaking and he would start dreaming of making his own watch. His experience at this time still inspires him and drives him to this very day. Sadly though, his family would be struggling financially and to help support, Jacob would drop out of school at the age of 16. At this time, he considered becoming a photographer or a hairstylist, but ultimately he took advantage of a program for immigrants and signed up for a six month government course in jewelry design. He attended a jeweler's trade school in Brooklyn and the first piece he ever created was a brass jewelry box which won him the class design competition. 
He finished the course in record time. I've seen articles saying that he did it in about four months and quickly started working at a local Jewish wholesale jewelry factory that made mass market pieces for department stores. Around this time is when he anglicized his birth name to Jacob Arabo. At the factory, Jacob would lie about his age with him pretending to be 18 so he could start earning a salary, which at the time was just $125 a week which now is approximately over $330. In today's time, getting over $330 a week for a 16 year old is pretty good, but for Jacob, it just wasn't cutting it, especially since he had dropped out of school and wanted to earn enough money to take care of his family. He was excelling at making jewelry, but putting together someone else's designs wasn't satisfying for him. I was bored making this mass market jewelry. I wanted to make it more stylish. I grew up with five women in my house, my sisters and my mother, and I was always fixing their earrings, their bracelets, and I was good with my hands. I knew that I could do better than what the company I was working for was doing. After work, Jacob began to design his own pieces and manufactured them using a makeshift workspace in his bedroom. His designs would catch on and he would begin developing a clientele and soon after he started making more money from his side business than his actual job. Now with the solid customer base, Jacob would quit his day job and would open his own retail stall on 6th Avenue and 47th Street in the heart of New York's Diamond District. He would begin to design collections for jewelry brands and private clients. He would display his creations in the window which immediately stood out from the others due to the unusual size and scope of his designs. His competition told him that he was wasting his time with show pieces. The pieces were nice to look at, but the bread and butter were engagement rings and wedding bands. There were 25 jewelers around him basically laughing at him, but his competitors weren't the only ones telling him that he was wasting his time. Before Jacob even went into business, his friends told him not to do it. They asked him what he was doing and how there were sharks going to be all around Jacob and they would eat him up alive. In response to this, Jacob said that he guessed that he had to become a shark and continued on with his dream. In an interview, when asked about how he stood out in New York City's jewelry district, Jacob said that he stood out by following his passion and his heart. He promised himself that he designed and created jewelry that he loved, that made him proud, that showed his vision. It wasn't always easy, but he was fortunate that his hard work and commitment led him to his own dreams coming true, so he continued to stay focused and worked hard. As a result, he was able to build a brand out of high quality and unique style pieces, which his clients appreciated. But back to Jacob's factory days, and he would work at the factory for four days a week, but on the other three days, he traveled to jewelry stores throughout New York and New Jersey selling his wares. This almost led to him getting robbed and killed on the road, and this further pushed him to open his own retail store, which was his stall on 6th Avenue in 1986. What also changed his mind wasn't necessarily his fear of being robbed of money or jewelry, but the problem is that he would buy on consent. Assignment. He owed people and if he got robbed, his life was over because nobody ever would trust him again. Jacob said that in this business, trust is everything. So 1986 is when Jacob would launch his own luxury brand, which is Jacob & Co. The very next year in 1987 is when Jacob's life would change forever. Hip hop legend Biz Marquis would come to Jacob with an unusual request of him wanting a signature piece of something so big and eye catching that it worked as a costume. Jacob would accept this challenge and design the now iconic four finger ring that spelled Biz in diamond studded script. About this, Jacob would say that back then nobody would make something like that. Biz Marquis loved it and wore it on the cover of his hit single Just a Friend. Biz Markey would be the first rapper who would bring attention to Jacob, but it would be Jacob's relationship with Biggie Smalls that would forever impact his legacy. 
Biggie was actually the one who named him Jacob the Jeweler and it stuck. Biggie had great ideas for jewelry and came in almost every week to see what Jacob was making. Now Jacob the Jeweler might be the most, if not one of the most iconic jewelers in rap history, but however, he isn't the first hip hop jeweler. One of the most well known early hip hop jewelers was a man who went by Manny, what also was known as Tito the Jeweler, who was an Ecuadorian immigrant who gained a cult following in the 70s, selling custom made pieces to pimps and drug dealers. All of the early rappers went to Manny's, Rakim, Salt and Peppa, Biggie, etc. But however, rappers started going elsewhere with their money in which Manny has said that he should have fought harder for what he had. Rap pioneer Roxanne Shante was questioned why people made the shift over to Jacob and she said it was because he didn't question their money. A lot of times when you're someone bringing over $10,000 in cash, you want your money to be respected and accepted. Jacob didn't put people through any hassle and he took it. According to Roxanne, Jacob also filled out the appropriate IRS forms and filed them and that there's nothing wrong with taking cash as payment. The fact that Jacob didn't embarrass people was to his credit. People also messed with Jacob because he accommodated his customers by taking commissions and then when the time came accepted old pieces back in trade as long as the new job was more expensive than the previous one he also never repurposed his designs there was a coolness to jacob with his charisma and style when asked about the reason people came to him jacob would say that he always treated his customers with respect as a young man he genuinely admired what they did he admired their success he also wanted to create the styles of jewelry that they wanted but executed at the highest level with the type of craftsmanship and stones that were the very best. When it comes to promotion, why did Jacob need to do that? When he was building strong relationships and through word of mouth, he was able to surround himself in the celebrity culture. The celebrities came knocking at his door and in rap history, his name alone has been name dropped in countless songs. Whether it's Kanye on Touch the Sky, rapping about how he went to Jacob an hour after he got his advance, Jay-Z name dropping him on Beyonce's song Upgrade You, or 50 Cent mentioning him in his song Get In My Car. There's countless songs that Jacob has mentioned in. In the interview, Jacob said that he's been mentioned in nearly 70 songs. The funny thing about this is that Jacob recalls hearing people name drop him in songs and he's never met them in person like. but the people that jacob really credits rap wise in promoting his brand was jay-z and diddy i'm going to first start off with jay-z and jay has name dropped jacob in a couple of songs they've had a long relationship together and people back in the 90s probably can remember when jay-z was pushing platinum really heavy on one of my favorite Jay-Z songs, Imaginary Player, he rapped about rocking platinum when people thought that it was silver and also said in the song that he himself had to be the pioneer of it. The idea for platinum came from Jacob, who for years had been selling fine engagement rings in platinum settings. He figured, why not start making men's jewelry in platinum? Another connection Jay-Z would have with Jacob is having him make the iconic Rockefeller chains. I read that Jacob mainly made those chains, but by far, whenever I think of the Rockefeller chains, I think of the moment that Dame Dash was arguing with Avi over the Rockefeller chain. Like, that clip is just so funny. But now on to Diddy on the other hand, and he first came to Jacob and asked him to put a diamond bezel on his gold Rolex. It had never been done before on a man's piece. Jacob agreed to do this without fully being sure if it was even possible to do it. He would go to work and a few weeks later, Diddy was the only rapper with a diamond bezel on a Rolex. Since that moment, Jacob had people wanting to put diamonds on the Rolexes and even more people coming to him to put diamonds on their other watches. Diddy throughout the years has gotten plenty of custom pieces from Jacob and to this day, they remain close friends. Since we're talking about rappers and jewelry, how can can we not bring up the jewelry king a man who took the jewelry thing to the next level in the rap sphere and that person is slick rick how can you forget about when slick rick did an interview on rap city at jacob the jeweler's shop with jacob the jeweler there slick would hire jacob to make an extravagant diamond eye patch to replace the normal eye patch that he'd been wearing his entire life he's also gotten bracelets and custom 
Rolexes from Jacob as well. Another rapper who comes to mind when talking about Jacob and has one of the more notable Jacob shout outs is Kanye West. Earlier, I talked about how on the song Touch the Sky, Kanye rapped about going to Jacob an hour after he got his advance because he wanted to shine. As detailed in Kanye's pre-college dropout song, Wow, he said that he went to Jacob with $25,000. I read that when Kanye first signed his deal with Rockefeller, he went straight to Jacob and spent $25,000 on a necklace. I've also seen that at one point in time, Kanye also briefly considered doing a line of sneakers with Jacob. But in an interview, Jacob talks about how at Christmas time, there were five or six trucks waiting with their blinkers on outside of his store. He remembered Kanye West sitting there for two hours waiting for him. He said that Kanye was in his early 20s at the time and he was wearing braces. Now you might be wondering what piece did Jacob make for Kanye? Well, this is a hilarious story told by Torre who is a journalist along with many other things. Now Torre said that he was the first one outside of Kanye's circle to see his Jesus piece that he just got from Jacob the jeweler. What caught Torre's eye was that the Jesus piece was white with blue eyes and blonde hair. Now, personally, I'm not going to get into that whole what color is Jesus thing. You know what I mean? I'm not going to do that in this video. But I know that some people can get really sensitive over that. But Torre asked Kanye why he got a white Jesus piece if he thought that Jesus was black. The story is actually pretty hilarious. And I managed to find the article from 2004 where there's some more details with the article talking about how Kanye loved the blue eyes, but he knew that he would get too much flack for it. Jacob popped out the blue stones, but Kanye then discovered that no other colored stones look good on the piece like <laughs> But it makes it all the more hilarious that Jacob now sells white and black Jesus pieces like <laughs> like thank you Kanye but by far Jacob's favorite customer was Pharrell He's known him since he was 18 years old. Pharrell came by to buy a piece of jewelry from Jacob that cost him $1,200 and he negotiated the price down to $900. Jacob said that he always believed in Pharrell and he knew that he was going to grow in the music industry so he introduced him to the Japanese designer Nigo. If you don't know who Nigo is, he founded the Japanese clothing brand A Bathing Ape. Jacob has made some crazy jewelry for Pharrell over the years all with eye-popping colors and unique designs. The man even made an 18 karat gold Blackberry cover for Pharrell, which really shows the times when this all happened. But in all seriousness, we would be here all day talking about all the rappers that have gotten pieces from Jacob. People like Tupac, Met the Man, Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, The Game, 50 Cent, and so many more. Keep in mind, I'm pretty much just talking about rap because his customers expand far beyond rap best believe. But the earliest memory that I have of Jacob the Jeweler is when he appeared in one of my favorite games of all time that I played all the time as a kid and is very near, and when I say very, very near and dear to my heart and that's Def Jam Fight for New York. Of course, as a kid, I always wanted my creative character in the game to be iced out, have all the bling and all that, and I would go to Jacob & Co to get my shine on. The player could purchase jewelry from him during the story mode and you could also play with him as a character in the game. But going back a little bit, and the year of 2001 would be a very significant year in Jacob the Driller's story with this being the year that he would return to his love of making watches. At first, Jacob concentrated on jewelry, but watches were always in the back of his mind. His love for watches had him go to Switzerland to find suppliers to make his dream of making watches a reality. The vendors in Switzerland brushed me off. It was very difficult to build a relationship with any of them as they were very rude and the prices were too expensive almost as a punishment for being American. I decided to start with the simpler quartz watch that didn't need the Swiss. I made the five time zone watch where you could change the look of the watch when you wanted to do the different bezels and straps. I still wear the first one I made. That timepiece really revolutionized fashion watches. It was very difficult 
difficult for Jacob to try to break into the Swiss watchmaking community because it's a very small industry and they don't accept strangers easily. You have to really prove yourself and they either have to love you or your designs. They don't really care about the money, but it ended up working for Jacob. It took him some time to earn their respect and he eventually did. It would be a photo of supermodel Naomi Campbell with the five time zone watch that put Jacob's company on the map for watches. With the five time zone watch launching in 2002 being a colorful piece with customizable bezels and straps. This specific watch would spark a revolution in watch design. You can see countless rappers wearing variations of this watch. People like Meek Mill, Jay-Z, Drake, ASAP Rocky, ASAP Ferg, etc. But after making the five times on watch and the world map, Jacob received phone calls from Italian, French, Russian, Japanese, and Chinese distributors to buy watches. To him, that was a great achievement because he was an American company making watches in Switzerland with without a Swiss office. Things would be changing for Jacob with him going back to Switzerland a few years later with a much better reception now. He would also in 2004 move from the Diamond District to another location. Business would still be booming, but by 2006, things would drastically take a turn for the worse. In 2006, Jacob would be arrested. He would be involved in the Black Mafia family indictment, and if you don't know who that is, then definitely give it a quick Google search because you should definitely know like who they are, especially if you're familiar with hip hop or rap culture. But in the indictment, there was a paragraph dedicated to Jacob saying, Jacob Arabo facilitated the purchase of jewelry utilizing the drug proceeds of Terry Lee Flannery, Demetrius Flannery, Flannery, the brothers who were allegedly BMS leaders in order to conceal the true source, nature, and ownership of the funds involved in these transactions. Jacob was also being charged with the failure to file Forms 8300, which is required by the IRS for cash transactions over $10,000 after having received large sums of currency from the Flannery brothers and others on their behalf, and with the knowing acceptance of large sums of currency, money money orders and cashier's checks from persons he knew to be nominees of the Flannery's. Basically, a nominee is a person that provides fraudulent qualifications and or identity so that the true identity of the money launderer is concealed. But after getting arrested, Jacob would bond out and in 2008, he would plead guilty to falsifying records and giving false statements as part of a deal with federal prosecutors. He would be sentenced to 2.5 years in federal prison. In response to this, Jacob said that he felt ashamed that he broke the laws of this country, which is a country that has been so good for him. It was a shame that he would live with for the rest of his life. It's sad to see a man come from such humble beginnings with many setbacks to being one of the most sought after jewelers in the world to land himself behind bars. So in prison is where Jacob sat until he was released in 2010. Upon being released, Jacob was sent to a halfway house where during the day he would leave to help his wife run the jewelry company and at night he would return to the house. For a long time, it seemed like Jacob had a stronghold over the industry when it came to jewelry and other things, but throughout the years, there have been numerous people who have came to rival him as mentioned earlier. One thing that's for certain is that at one point in time, and even now, having a Jacob was the ultimate sign of status. It was what all the rappers were rapping about and what the celebrities were being pictured in. Even after spending time in prison and having increased competition, Jacob still remains to be a top player. I mean, recently, we've seen the likes of Lil Uzi Vert and Nigo do a music video in Jacob the Jewelers Shop and him appearing in Drake's When to Say When and Chicago Freestyle video. The rappers of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s loved Jacob and his work, but even the new or the newer generations of people in the 2010s and 2020s still show him mad love. I mean, personally, I'm really not into jewelry myself, but I still admire some of the pieces, and when something is cool, something is cool to me, and you can't even hate on it. But with me being a really big fan of rap in general, especially being a huge fan of the rap in the 2000s, doing this video about Jacob was something that I've been wanting to do, especially 
especially since I haven't seen an extensive video done on him before like detailing his whole history and his connection to the rap culture. Also, like I said, I am super sorry if I mispronounced some things in this video, like it is what it is. I'm only human, but all in all, let me know what you guys thought of the video in the comment section below. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.